and welcome to Temple Talks. This is Yitzhak Ruven speaking to you from south of Jerusalem here in the holy, beautiful, treasured land of Israel. Today is Rosh Chodesh Elul. It's actually the 30th day of the month of Av, but it's the first day of, of Rosh Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh Elul, this evening. It will be the first day of Elul when there is a two-day Rosh Chodesh. It begins on the final day of the outgoing month and concludes on the first day of the incoming month. It is the 3rd of September, 2024. This coming Shabbat, we read Parshat Shoftim, Judges, from the book of Deuteronomy, beginning with chapter 16, verse 18, concluding chapter 21, verse 9. It is indeed Rosh Chodesh. And Rosh Chodesh is, of course, a holiday, a day of bringing korbanot, offerings, in the Holy Temple. A day that signifies renewal because the moon, it wanes and disappears, but then it reappears and grows again, which uh, is symbolic of the ability to grow and to change and to return to Hashem, to do tshuva, to mend our ways and to be better people. And we really need that encouragement now uh, here in Israel and Jews around the world. And I say any um, decent person around the world, and there are many of them, who believes in life and in justice and in in decency. Um, Because, of course, just yesterday and the day before, we here in Israel buried six hostages who were murdered, executed, um, just, they say, between 24 and 48 hours before their bodies were discovered by IDF forces in Rafah, in Gaza. Remember Rafah? Keep eyes on, on all eyes on Rafah. Remember uh, Vice President Harris saying, uh, Israel better not go in there. I've seen the maps. Uh, they, there's no place for those people to go. And how the Biden administration held up Israel with arms embargoes and, and threats and for months before Israel finally said enough is enough and went into Rafiach. We call it Rafiach here. It's also known as Rafah. And um, yeah, that's where these that's where these hostages were being held, including a Hirsch, uh, the American citizen whose parents. Uh, spoke both at the Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention. And um, it just sickens me. It sickens me. It all sickens me. But it really sickens me, the complete cynical response of President Biden and Harris. I don't know if Harris is even related. I guess she said something about this, that, uh, you know, this war has to end and all the suffering has to end, blah, blah, blah. And when uh, the same day that Hirsch Poland was buried, uh, Joe Biden, after returning from his, I don't know, endless vacation and having a meeting uh, to discuss the situation, uh, was asked by a reporter if Netanyahu was doing enough in order to basically surrender to Hamas demands. Uh, Biden said no. So I have a message for Biden. And uh, read my lips. Okay, read my lips. I'm not going to say it out loud, but read my lips. I have a message for Biden. Your incredible weakness, your incredible lack of any morality, incredible what you've done to America, you've taken a, the world's most powerful country, a beacon, and turned it into into a, a, a I don't know, a, a dump where all the nations all dump on you and you do nothing about it. American citizens, forget the Israeli citizens, American citizens, you refuse to do anything. You keep pressuring Israel. What have you done to pressure Hamas, Qatar, Iran, zero they're your friends. They're your allies. It's disgusting. It disgusts me. Last night, Prime Minister Netanyahu gave a 45-minute uh, press conference and then answered questions, by the way. Anybody who's running for president of the United States, for Democratic Party, might uh, take a lesson that, yes, 
responsibility. Leadership means you stand in front of the nation and you say what you need to say and you answer questions. You take questions and you answer. He did not, he did not evade a single question, even though there were very pointed questions. So it seems that uh, the President of the United States is blaming Israel, Netanyahu, for the murder of these six, the execution of these six hostages. And um, the insane, small, but very vocal and very powerful extreme left in Israel is blaming Netanyahu. They've been blaming him for everything from uh, the weather to, uh, I don't know why the sky is blue for the past dozen years. They'll just latch onto any issue and try to tear the country apart with it. I think the country is by and large, for the most part, fed up and tired of their antics, their tactics. Anyway, you can hear that I'm a very, very upset. Um, and as Netanyahu said in his uh, address last night, Israel will not leave the Philadelphia corridor, the border between uh, Gaza and Egypt, because that is precisely where all the weapons and all the materials and all the money and all the terrorists that Hamas needs in order to continue to terrorize. And, uh, you know, get it through your head, world. Israel is not going to leave the uh, Philadelphia corridor, corridor, corridor. And uh, many, many people here in Israel are calling upon is uh, Israel to basically um, completely take over half of Gazan territory and uh, populate it with Jews because uh, killing terrorists and killing Palestinians doesn't really seem to matter, right? They don't, that doesn't deter Hamas or any of the other Iranian proxies or even the Palestinian terrorists who aren't necessarily affiliated with Iran. But taking their land does make an impression. Giving up the land, as we did 20 years ago, uh, in the, uh, the uh, I don't remember the word for, for it in English, when Israel pulled all the Jews living there and the army out of Gaza. That certainly didn't work, did it? Did it, Ariel Sharon, who laughed at those who warned that this would happen, and many other security uh, generals, uh, politicians laughed, mocked everybody who said this is what was going to happen. And this is what happened. And uh, Britain, again, the same day that uh, Israel was burying its six executed hostages, um, Britain announced that they were going to be uh, banning the delivery uh, of certain military uh, supplies that Israel has been regularly supplied by Britain. So there's another staunch ally of terror, staunch ally of Hamas, but who can, I mean, this is Britain, basically a Muslim country today, right? Yeah, the West is in serious trouble, and the only one, the only nation who seems to be standing up and fighting, not only on behalf of herself, but on behalf of the West, is Israel. And um, God willing, uh, there will be a change of leadership in the United States in the near future and uh, which will hopefully restore Americans America's uh, status in the world and and America's return America to their proper allegiances and proper principles um, enough is enough and uh, it's been a very, very, very tough week this week. So as I began, it is Rosh Chodesh, and it is a time to celebrate. Um, but it's very difficult at this time for all that's happening. You know, one of the six uh, hostages who was shot in the back of the head um, and executed was someone by the name of Almug Sarusi, uh, late in last December, I believe, 
uh, myself and a few friends traveled to the um, Gaza envelope, the area that where the towns, the kibbutzim and towns that were attacked on October 7th. We were in that area. We visited in the city of Sderot where the, there was a devastating battle in the police station there, the police headquarters. The army eventually had to just bomb the building itself in order to eliminate all the terrorists inside. We were there, we were in in Ofakim, where we met uh, and, and spent hours with a policeman who that morning, Shabbat morning, and, and uh, Simchat Torah was coming back from the synagogue when he heard firing of heard uh, bullets being fired. He ran in his house, got his gun, and spent the next 18 hours f fighting battles in the streets and barring people's cars in order to drive injured people to the hospital uh, 25 minutes away and then returning to return to the battle. And then we were in... Um, and then we made it to the concert area uh, the Nova area, where, of course, if you've probably seen the pictures, there are photos of, of all the people who were killed there, the people who were taken into captivity there. And while we were there, we heard a few people singing happy birthday. And we went over to find out what was going on. And it was the mother, the sister, and the brother of Almog Sarusi. It was his 27th birthday. And they were there singing him happy birthday and full of confidence that he would return. And he stayed strong and stayed alive and had our soldiers manage to uh, get, get there a little bit earlier. He might be back home today, as might the other five hostages, and Israel would be celebrating instead of mourning. Alas, it wasn't meant to be. But this is the reality that we are in here in Israel right now. I don't, I don't wish it upon anybody else. I know it's it's pr pretty much impossible for anyone not living here or not having spent time here this past year to, even with all the goodwill in the world and all the sympathy and, and compassion and and identification with us can really understand what we're living through. Um, not easy. And um, especially when people overseas are getting their news filtered through um, a really twisted and slanted reporting, um, which I don't know why uh, the, the media especially the legacy media, uh, feels that, uh, feels such a hostility toward Israel, uh, but they do. And so if you're relying on those media sources, then you're certainly not getting the, the real story or anything near the real story of what is happening here. So we are not a news organization, so I don't bring you the news uh, on the Temple Talk, but uh, sometimes, like today, I feel compelled to share with you some of the things that are going on, and um, again, we here in Israel, especially we here in Israel who are very connected to the Torah and live a Torah life, we see everything through the filter and the light of the Torah, understand the reality through that filter. And that's how we understand and how we shape things. And of course, the Parsha, the weekly Torah reading, always, always reflects somehow, some way, on the current events, on the actual reality, what we're actually living through in that very week. This particular... Uh, Parsha is called Shoftim, which means judges, and it starts like this here in Hebrew, and then in English, Shoftim, and I'm reading from uh, chapter nine, chapter 16, verse 18, book of 
of Deuteronomy, Shoftim v'shotrim titen lecha mechol sh'arecha asher Hashem aloecha noten lecha lishvatecha v'shavtu et ha'am mishpat sedek lo tate mishpat lo takir panim v'lo tikach shochad ki ha'shochad i'aver ene chachamim v'salef tivre tzadikim tzedek tzedek tirdof l'ma'an tichyeh v'yarashta et ha'aretz asher Hashem aloecha noten lach Judges and officers shall you appoint in all your cities. Actually, the literal term is in all your gates, because in the gates of the cities, that's where the judges sat. That's where, uh, that's where justice was was meted out. Judges and officers shall you appoint in all your cities, which Hashem, your God, gives you for your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert judgment. You shall not respect someone's presence, and you shall not accept a bribe, for the bribe will blind the eyes of the wise and make just words crooked. Righteousness, righteousness shall you pursue, so that you will live and possess the land that Hashem, your God, gives you. The Torah makes it very clear. We're here because we need to pursue justice. Everything, our existence here in the land of Israel is completely contingent on our behavior, on our morality as a society, not to mention as individuals. And there's nothing more important in the eyes of Hashem than pursuing justice. And again, justice is a pursuit. It's not necessarily something that you can unequivocally always, always achieve. It's very difficult, and in fact, this parsha concludes with that very fascinating and, and mysterious almost uh, talk uh, story of a person who was found, a body of a person found outside of a town in an open area, and obviously they they died from some violent way, and it's nobody knows who, how, what, and it's it's literally a case uh, where it's impossible to achieve justice because there's just not enough known about it. So the Torah describes a remedy, a process, a, a ritual really, a ceremony, uh, taking a, going out to an, uh, a wild area outside the town, the closest town uh, where this person was found. The elders are there and they have a, a, a heifer and uh, they basically behead the heifer and uh, spill its blood on that land and then wash their hands uh, in a river that's there and say our hands have not shed this blood and they haven't really achieved anything other than they have said we are basically asking forgiveness for not being able to ascertain what happened. And so even in a case where it is impossible to get to the bottom of what happened, we still need to make an effort to somehow uh, bring the episode to a, a just conclusion. And again, as I said, even when when the facts are known, it's not always so easy to actually be able to say, yes, we achieved justice. Uh, not always so easy, but in any case, you need to pursue, pursue justice. That's what Torah is telling us uh, when it says, Tzedek, tzedek, tiradov. Justice, justice you shall pursue so that you can live and, and inherit this land. That's what's important, that endless effort which requires righteousness, which requires staying away from bribery, staying away from not honoring someone who's very rich but just simply because they're rich or someone who's very poor simply because they're very poor or someone who has influence. Um, you gotta be. You have to be 
true true to the Torah and you have to be um, completely devoted to achieving justice and as it says you know you can't accept a bribe it's a bribe will blind the eyes of the wise even a wise person it's not simply you know bribery isn't simply for you know the the weak or the or the ignorance or the or the you know crude uh, yeah, bribery can can pervert it says right here can pervert the judgment of a righteous person if they allow it so it's a warning it is a warning there are many warnings many warnings many mitzvot uh, in this week's parsha show team that have to do with what Israel needs to do once she is in the land in order to establish and maintain a Torah based just society we talk about the judges and the the show team. today a show is, is what we call the police I don't think that these were exactly policemen but they were they were I think officials who were meant to assist the judges and help to achieve uh, justice and also I, I believe in some capacity to keep the peace and um, we also learn about uh, if you decide you want a king Israel might want a king and the Torah tells us if you want a king you have first of all it has to be from your own people and then it gives limitations to the king it's not an absolute monarch this king is told that he he can't acquire too much wealth and he can't acquire too many possessions in this case horses and he certainly must never bring the people back to Egypt that is you know in any way um, bring the people back to exile and of course he needs to write not one but two Sifrei Torah two Torah scrolls and um, keep one with him all the time in order to impress upon him that he also is subject to the Torah everyone is he is not above the law um, he is bound by the law just like every other uh, member of his people um, we talk it uh, the Parsha talks about about uh, going out to war All right let's look for that right now um, oh, here chapter 20 verse 1 when you go out to the battle against your enemy and you see horse and chariot a people more numerous than you you shall not fear them for Hashem your God is with you who brought you up from the land of Egypt it shall be that when you draw near to the war the Kohen shall approach and speak to the people he shall say to them hear O Israel you are not you are coming near to the battle against your enemies let your heart not be faint do not be afraid do not panic and do not be broken before them for Hashem your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you with your enemies to save you then the officer shall speak to the people saying who is the man who has built a new house and has not inaugurated it let him go and return to his house lest he die in the war and another man will inaugurate it and who is the man who has planted a vineyard and not redeemed it let him go and return to his house lest he die in the war and another man will redeem it and who is the man who has betrothed the woman and not married her let him go and return to his house lest he die in the war and another man will marry her the officers shall continue speaking to the people and say who is the man who is fearful and faint-hearted let him go and return to his house and let him not melt the heart of his fellows like his heart when the officers have finished speaking to the people the leaders of the legions shall take command of the head of the people and it goes on to talk about more rules conduct of war but um, these words which I just read of course um, we've been focusing on these words here in Israel in our hearts and on the battlefield for many a month now uh, many a commander in Gaza has said these very words um, to the people to the soldiers do not be afraid do not be afraid because they're more numerous than us Hashem is is fighting our battle for us and um, uh, that is the truth you know we we have seen so many miracles 
you know, we had one day is a miracle, one day is a tragedy. Sometimes you, it's all in one. You know, the same tra a tragedy is a miracle, and, and the same events. But um, we paid a very heavy price. But Hashem is fighting with us, alongside us, and He will not allow us to to lose this battle so long as we have the courage to continue to fight. And um, this discussion about people who bought a house or planted a vineyard, or became engaged. Um, so many soldiers, I mean, so many cases where a soldier has died. In fact, one of the six uh, captives who was murdered and buried yesterday um, had a child born to his, his wife, gave birth to a child after he had been captured. He never, ever met his infant child, and that child will never meet their father. Um, and there's been many cases like that, and happier cases also of soldiers who have, have been in battle when a child was born, when a brief circumcision took place, when a pidyon, a ben, a redemption of the firstborn, which is a ceremony involving a kohen, and sometimes you see videos of them uh, participating by, by a phone from afar. Uh, so many cases of soldiers proposing to other soldiers or proposing to their to their girlfriend on their on their leave um, and or getting out of the army and getting married or you know uh, one friend who you know was in the hospital for six months and and now is uh, missing a leg will be the best man at uh, at his friend's wedding to so many I don't know how to describe them they're 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 heartwarming they're beautiful they're tragic um, but uh, so this whole uh, section here where it talks about these considerations uh, they're real they're real and the Torah wants to be as humane um, as, as possible um, and uh, so does the uh, Israeli army, not only vis-a-vis uh, -vis being a humane army in how we treat our enemies, but being a humane army in how we treat our own soldiers and their families. And uh, Everyone will tell you that the heroes here in Israel are not only the soldiers who have been fighting for months and months. Some individuals, many individuals, actually have been fighting and away from home for for months after months but also their families their wives um, and their children and their extended family it's very very difficult everybody has to carry on and keep on keeping on it's not easy and people who have been they're fighting so they're away from their work for month after month it makes it very very difficult and I just want to say that uh, I've been saying, you know, the soldiers in Gaza and the wives at home, uh, we also have many, many uh, female soldiers um, who have really proven their, their courage, their strength, their abilities beyond, uh, beyond what I think anybody could have imagined in this, in this war. They are true warriors. Uh, alongside uh, the m male soldiers so yeah that's where we're at and like I said the Parsha just brings it home reading from the Torah just brings it home um, and um, what else is in this very very beautiful Parsha very poignant uh, there are many other things as well those are the major points I really wanted to to bring out again there's also a section on uh, future prophets Moshe says I'm not the only prophet there will be more prophets and, and God sends the prophets because he wants to communicate with you but you also have to be careful that the prophet uh, that is speaking is speaking in God's name and is not uh, trying to add or take away anything from the Torah itself and that the prophet uh, is not trying to uh, 
push you uh, in the direction of, of idolatry, worshiping another god other than Hashem. So these are all uh, the things that you need to consider. When a prophet arises, uh, you have to listen carefully and have to judge very carefully. And of course, the age of prophecy ended uh, at the very beginning of the Second Temple period. And will it return? So uh, it might. Uh, many say that it will return, and then maybe it will return very soon. In the meantime, um, we don't have prophecy, but uh, we do have many, many very great people who speak very profound and deep truths and um, seem to have what we have referred to as Ruach HaKodesh, a, a holy inspiration that uh, guides them. In any case, we are um, we we'll keep on keeping on here. Let's talk a bit about Elo. Ani dodi v'dodi li Elo, the name of the sixth month of the Hebrew year. Um, spelled in Hebrew, Aleph Lamed Vav Lamed, which are the Rashi Tevot, really the initials for the words Ani Dodi Vadodi Li, which is from the Song of Songs, and it means I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. And that is a reference in in the month of Elul to our closest to Hashem. And that uh, it's a very, very important month because it's the month that proceeds and leads up to the month of Tishrei, the month of Rosh Hashanah, the month of Yom Kippur, and of course Sukkot. You have Yom, uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are the days of standing before Hashem and making account of ourselves. And um, leading up to that, we need to really focus on who we are, who we've been, who we're meant to be, who God intended us to be when he created us. We're here for a purpose, otherwise we wouldn't be here, each and every one of us. And our task in life is to discover that purpose and to fulfill that purpose, uh, to make our time here on this earth important and to make ourselves to be real partners uh, and assisting Hashem in making a better world, in perfecting creation. That's what we're here for. And the month of Elul is a fantastic opportunity to really um, just take advantage. No holidays, no distractions, but we can really focus on, on tweaking all those things in our lives that need to be tweaked, on, on refining all those things in our, in our souls, and in our behavior that need to be refined. And if we need to change directions, this is the time to really focus on on getting the grip and changing direction because a new year beckons us and Hashem is waiting with open arms. He wants us to, to prevail. He wants us to succeed. He wants us to, to flourish. And uh, we simply need to rise up to the occasion to do everything we can do uh, to improve ourselves, to make make our lives better, make the people around us improve their lives, be better people. And um, let's all uh, pray for a very, very good month. Basarot Tovot, we should only hear good news. And um, as we approach the new year in this very, very special month of Elul, uh, let us all do our very best, to be our very best. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much for being with me. Temple Talk.